The second section is plot. As you can already see, if you've created a really solid, engaging character, you've gone quite a long way to solving the plot. But essentially, plot boils down to giving your character a really thorny problem that at the start of the story that they strain every reserve in order to resolve. With shocking developments and startling new information drip-fed along the way. If you really understand your character and are living through him or her, then you'll instinctively know what they'll do next at any point in the story. Meaningful events change people in meaningful ways and hold the seeds of the next action so that each action in the novel is linked together in a cause and effect chain. So rather than a necklace with beads, uh, where no bead is related to, to another, a watertight narrative is a chain where each link is connected to the one before and the one after. Something that's quite helpful to bear in mind is if you're having trouble thinking what a character would do at a certain point in the plot, is ask yourself what would be an ideal solution for their problem at that point in time and then you can decide what they'll do in that situation. A really good tip is to try and leave a novel in a really different place from where it began and this also gives you some something to work towards. It's also really satisfying for a reader if a character overcomes their initial problem in a very surprising way but a way that feels natural to that character too. Really, all novels are mysteries. So decide what you're withholding from the reader and then work towards revealing that bit by bit, creating longing for that information and then drip feed it throughout the narrative. When I was writing my first novel, The Land of Decoration, I found it really helpful to have a very clear idea of what was happening at the end and work my way backwards from it. So I asked myself what needed to happen in order for the ending to happen and then what needed to happen for that penultimate event to happen and so on and so on and so on. Another piece of advice that might be helpful is to think of writing a novel like you're writing a short story which means there's no room for anything that's superfluous or unnecessary and then you can go in later and fill in the spaces, the texture, the descriptions probably all the bits that you really want to put in there but often you'll find they're not necessary because the dialogue and the action have taken care of conveying to the reader all the necessary information and actually your work will be a lot stronger from it. I really really struggled with that because I'm naturally a very descriptive writer and not very plot driven at all so it, it was... It, <laughs> my brain was kind of reformulated when I wrote The Land of Decoration, which I feel is the most plot-driven of my novels. And, yeah, it was kind of rewired. <laughs> Something I found useful when writing my novels was to divide the plot up into five sections and say what was happening in each section. I found five, not a good number, not too few, not too many, a bit like an arch, so there's two either side of this central section. And in each section I tried to say in a sentence or two what was happening within that section. If I couldn't say what was happening in a sentence or two, I knew I needed to simplify the action of that section. This helped me see the book as a whole and how each part related to every other. You can divide up these five sections into still smaller ones if you want, but you'll have created a really strong overarching structure to adhere to. The five stages I divided my novels into were one, inciting incident, two, progressive complication, life getting more difficult for the character, remembering that the story mustn't retreat into lesser difficulties, three, crisis, decision, danger or opportunity, four, climax, and five, resolution. If your novel has overt demarcations, 
for instance, different parts, then you can also adapt this bit of advice and try and sum up what is happening in each of those parts of your novel in one sentence. It's also helpful to think of there being five mini parts within each of those larger parts of the novel. Once you've crystallised this main structure, you can add smaller scenes, always making sure to work from what is absolutely necessary to make the end event happen outwards. This roots out a relevant backstory and explanation. Now we move on to scenes. Some things I found useful when working on individual scenes. For each scene, I wrote a reasonably short sentence saying what happens, and then a reasonably short sentence saying what purpose it served. And if you can't think of what purpose it serves, the scene should probably be cut. It's also useful to ask, is each scene in a different place at the end to, to where it was when it began? Because each scene mirrors the movement of the novel as a whole. Is conflict increasing? Is each scene advancing the plot? Is there change brought about through conflict? Is there action and reaction? Monitoring the tone, texture and pace of a single scene is important to give variation and relief for the reader. And also it helps to think about how each scene relates to the next. So if you have a scene that's jam-packed with action and is very significant, the next scene won't work as well if it's exactly the same. So monitor the, the feel, the pace, the tone of each scene. Final notes about plot. At key moments, are there acts of no return? If a problem is worth creating, it's worth hanging on to, long enough to make the reader care. Don't jettison problems too quickly. Think about what questions you want the reader to be asking at certain points in the novel. This keeps you focused on what you're trying to achieve at any one time. Some reader questions for my second novel, The Professor of Poetry, for example, were why did Edward and Elizabeth fall out and what happened in the Rose Garden? If you want to include flashbacks, they must be dramatised and only introduced when the reader's curiosity has been sufficiently piqued. Good examples of how to use flashbacks are found in Kazuo Ishiguro's fiction, for instance the novel The Remains of the Day or An Artist of the Floating World. Also a book that was so helpful to me when I was writing is a book, I don't know if it's still in print, actually I don't think it was even in print when I got hold of it, I got it hold of it second hand, it's called 20 Master Plots and How to Build Them by Ron Tobias. It has chapters or templates dealing with several key plots and pretty much any novel you can think of fits into one of those templates or sometimes two or three templates. For instance there are the quest plot, pursuit plot, escape, revenge, rescue, riddle, rivalry, underdog, temptation, metamorphosis, love, forbidden love, sacrifice, discovery. And if you are having trouble with your plot you can kind of use one of these as a template to fit over your plot and see where you may need to tweak it. But the book also deals with general principles that apply to any plot and which are invaluable in the construction of a working novel. Themes and ideology. I feel if a novel overtly foregrounds an ideology, political viewpoint or moral stance upon the reader, it weakens the novel. However, this doesn't mean that themes can't be foregrounded. I became a bit obsessive about my themes when I was writing my novels, mainly in order to limit them because I ten they tended to proliferate. So one thing I found helpful to keep me focused on the main strands of the novel were to write them down. For my second novel, The Professor of Poetry, I wrote down time, moment, transfiguration, music and words, and they were my keys. It's probably best not to have any more than, I'd say, about five main themes. A novel is a lengthy thing, and it's also a living thing, and like any living thing, and thing that goes on for a long time, it has a habit of morphing. So it's a 
quite discombobulating to find yourself with a different creature at chapter 20 to that which you were dealing with at chapter 2 and that's another reason I kept my five key words at the forefront of my attention when writing so that the novel stayed the same beast so to speak. Sometimes the key words were key phrases so for The Land of Decoration my first novel some of the key phrases were everything is everything else, small big, big small, something in another's place, something taken and lost and an eye for an eye. If the reader picks up on the fact that the writer is trying to say something, it kind of undoes what the writer is trying to say. So it's best to let your themes emerge themselves and let what you want to say just happen in the course of creating a really solid character and plot, which, as you now know, are pretty much one and the same thing. So if you focus on your character and you focus on being honest, observing clearly and kind of getting yourself out of the picture then what you want to say or what the novel wants to say is a better way of looking at it will happen spontaneously. I sincerely believe all great writing is simply is simply sustained intense observation the ability to see impartially piercingly and flawlessly. In a sense a novel is just a lens a watcher, a terribly keen, terribly sensitive witness. All the writer is doing is seeing. If you focus solely on saying as directly and accurately as you can how things which are deeply important to you appear to you, you'll be 80% of the way to writing well. So focus on relaying in the most truthful way that you can what you choose to place your attention on. And your insights, and your style, and your metaphors will come unbidden. Some concluding general advice. The most essential thing for a novelist to do, and this is based on marking a lot of students' work, is use clear language and sentence structures. If language is difficult for the reader to negotiate or respond to, a lot of their energy is taken up with that, which could be invested in relating to the character or the plot. There's a good trying to understand and a bad trying to understand, and if your sentences are just really muddy and unclear, the reader's energy is zapped, whereas the, the good trying to understand is trying to find out withheld information, for example, or trying to find out more about the character. Experimental prose is great, but it's generally best to master something before deviating from and subverting it. In fact, you can't subvert something until you've mastered it. Further to that, be consistent with your tenses and point of view. Give relief to the reader and the writing by varying the phases of a novel. There should be cycles and rhythms, periods of happiness and sadness, tension and relief from tension. A new set of circumstances works for a while and then the tension builds again. To cut everything you can, a good rule of thumb is to only have something present in the novel if it's giving the reader information. The old adage that is universally known but difficult to implement, show don't tell, still applies. So for instance if you're describing a face that you want the reader to feel is kind of ugly, don't say, don't use the word ugly, but describe it. Also don't tell the reader how to feel about things. It's really boring. In fact I've just read a book that completely contradicts this. <laughs> it's called No Longer Human in which the protagonist continually says my life is hopeless, my life is tragic, and it works, but as a fledgling novelist don't do that. Also remember that lots of really brilliant novels and poems for that matter and plays are second drafts and sometimes the second draft is unrecognisable. 
if you don't believe me, take a look at T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, the first version, and then look at Ezra Pound's revisions of it. It really should be credited to Ezra Pound as much as T.S. Eliot. It's worth saying as well that the idea that good writing is fancy writing, packed with complicated flourish and exaggerated similes and staggering metaphors is fallacious. Good writing can be extremely simple. If you don't believe me, look at Ernest Hemingway or J.M. Kutsia or M.J. Highland. Read good books or books you resonate with. A lot of my apprenticeship in novel writing was reading. I read what I guess I think are good books for years, years and years and years and years. And in this way you develop an instinct for what good writing is. And I think that is the reason when I started writing, after not very long I really found my feet and was able to write myself. And that's because I'd just taken in so many other writers or masters voices. I've got an image in my head of the little dog listening to the gramophone. Listening is a big part of speaking. A baby listens before they develop the ability to speak. And it's the same for writers. They have to take in a lot of words first. That's what I think anyway. It helps you develop an instinct for good writing. It's like taking in nutritious food rather than McDonald's in order to run a marathon. Reading is like taking in food and practicing writing yourself is like training for the marathon. It's really important to read your work aloud to other people and ideally have someone read it back to you. This shows you if it's working because if it's working another person can read, read a sentence and the stress will fall where it should and it sounds just as powerful as if you were reading it in your own mind. Get it out in the open. Did I do this with my novels? No, I didn't. But they'd probably be better if I had. Reading your own work to other people and having other people read it back to you is really important because writing a novel is only partly to do with what other people think of your work. The main thing should be, although this is very difficult to hang on to, when at least two critics completely tore one of my novels to shreds, actually a couple of my novels, I was devastated, which brought home again to me that it wasn't just what I thought of my books that mattered. But in an ideal world it would be. <laughs> All that really matters, it's just like being a good person, all that really matters is if you know you've tried your best to be a good person, uh, regardless of what other people think, and it's the same with a book. All that really matters is what you feel about the book. And becoming a good writer is getting to the point where you yourself can tell, can hear what's working and what isn't working. And when you know that, you won't need other people's opinion any longer. And you'll not only be a good writer, but a good reader too, which all good writers are. And that concludes my little talk about how to write a good novel. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this helps somebody somewhere and I will see you again soon. Bye bye.